The laws of rugby are intended to make the game fair and safe, but also to give a flow to the game to make it more appealing for fans to watch. Let's admit it, we all like to think that we're experts regarding the ins and outs of the rugby laws. Just give us the whistle and we'll show the officials how it's done. But I'm here to tell you that there are some laws that you probably don't know, lurking in the background, either because they're rarely required, rarely enforced, or just a bit odd. So here are seven little-known rugby laws, and I'm willing to bet that there are at least a few that you don't know. Of course, if an attacking player is in touch, whilst they are in the act of carrying the ball into the in-goal area and scoring a try, the try is disallowed. The defending team being awarded a 22 dropout if the attacking player makes contact or steps over either the touch in goal line or the dead ball line. Alternatively, if the attacking player is in touch outside of the in goal area, a line out is awarded to the defending team. But what you may not know is that as long as the attacking team is not holding on to the ball, they are legally allowed to score a try, even if they step outside of the field of play. Let's take a look at the law here. If a player is in touch or touch in goal, they can make a touchdown or score a try by grounding the ball in the in goal area, provided that they are not holding onto the ball. Yep, you heard that right. So if a player falls or dives on a loose ball in the in goal area, they are able to score a try whilst they're in touch. If you're struggling to visualise what this might look like, here is an example from Christian Raid utilising this exact law against Saracens in 2015. Christian Wade kicks in behind to get around the Saracens defenders. Alex Good makes his way across the field and looks to have things covered. But Wade just toes the ball ahead into the ingle area. Good gives a cheeky push to Wade and it looks like he may have just done enough to allow the ball to go over the dead ball line before Wade has a chance to reach it. But knowing the details of the laws, Wade quickly touches the ball down whilst he is clearly still in touch. This is brilliant thinking from Wade, as if he had tried to come back into the ingle area and then touch the ball down, the ball would have gone over the dead ball line and it would be Saracen's ball. We've all seen this situation before. A penalty kick bounces off the posts and the defensive team catches it, only to be on the receiving end of a bone-crunching tackle. Now the defending team are under pressure, make a poor clearance and continue to be on the back foot. One thing you rarely see being utilised is the fact that you can call a mark if you catch the ball directly after it's rebounded from the post. Upon finding this out, I was expecting the law to be a bit ambiguous or strangely worded, but it's actually pretty clear. The law states, a player may claim a mark even if the ball hits a goalpost or crossbar before being caught. Here's an example from Japan vs Scotland in the 2015 World Cup. Goromaru's penalty kick rebounds off the upright and Greg Laidlaw calmly catches the ball and calls for the mark. Now. He ultimately ends up taking a quick tap and kicking it to touch anyway. But if we run the situation here, where Laidlaw doesn't call for the mark, he gets smashed by Luke Thompson, and Scotland are under pressure on their own 5 metre line. It's definitely one of those things that logically makes sense if you think about it, but just looks a bit strange when you see it happen for real. Okay, I'm kind of cheating a bit here, because there are three laws that are very similar to each other around dummying in certain parts of the game. If we look under the ruck laws, there's a list of things that players must not do during a ruck, and one of them states, players must not take any action to make opponents believe that a ruck has ended when it has not, and the sanction for this is a free kick against the attacking team. In simple terms, the law basically says whilst the ball is in a ruck, 
don't dummy to make the ball look like it's off the ground when it actually isn't. Whilst this doesn't sound like much, it's actually a pretty handy little law. Imagine a scenario where you have a ruck set up and the opposition has their defensive line set, ready to rush up and make a tackle. Now, the scrum half dummies the ball to make it look as if he's picking it up off the ground and the defending team shoot off their line to make the tackle. Now the defending team are offside and either get penalised for that or told to retreat back onside, meaning that they're on the back foot and cannot make an effective tackle. So yeah, for me this definitely comes under the don't be a dick category of laws. There are two more laws that are nearly identical to this one. It's the same concept, but it's when a maul is formed, a player must not take any action to make the opponents believe that the maul has ended when it has not. And another one, a player must not take any action to make opponents believe that the scrum has ended when it has not. These are just little laws that you never really think about, but actually help the flow of the game hugely. I briefly talked about this one in my video on the choke tackle. Just to give you a fast forward version, the expected outcome of a choke tackle is that the team holding up the ball carrier would win a turnover in the form of a scrum. What is quite often overlooked by fans, commentators and even referees sometimes is how the outcome of the maul will change when it's formed directly after a kick. Let's take a look at item number 18 under the mauls in the law book. If a maul is formed immediately after a player has directly caused an opponent's kick in open play, a scrum that is awarded for any of the above reasons, those being the usual reasons for a turnover when a team uses the choke tackle, the scrum will be awarded to the team of the ball catcher. So if the choke tackle is set up holding up an opposition player who has just caught a kick from your team, the ensuing scrum is awarded to the team in possession. There is no turnover. Here's an example. Johnny Sexton puts up the kick and Will Genia catches it. Now, there's no tackle, no pass. In fact, Genia barely gets a chance to see who is in front of him before he gets wrapped up by Rob Carney and Jamie Heaslip. Ireland successfully set up the choke tackle, but Bryce Lawrence awards the scrum to Australia as it was straight from the kick. Teams must not use the cavalry charge or flying wedge. A flying wedge is initiated from a penalty or a free kick, where the attacking player tap kicks the ball and usually passes it to a teammate who will move towards the goal line. The attacking player's teammates now bind onto the ball carrier before contact has been made with the opposition and drive forwards, usually directly over the try line. As you can imagine, not only is this pretty much unstoppable, but very dangerous. A cavalry charge is fairly similar, but this time, players from the attacking team stand a distance behind the mark and start running towards the try line before the ball has been tapped, usually a metre or two apart from each other. The idea here is that you don't know who is going to catch the ball. The defending team can't move towards the attacking team until the ball has been tapped, this means that they're essentially flat-footed and hit by a player who's at full tilt. So those are seven rugby laws that you may not have known existed. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see similar content on this channel, please be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Cheers!